So throughout 1971, more and more activity. Brisbane, Melbourne, Sydney, Adelaide, even in the Northern Territory, the Larrakia people. The magnificent Larrakia people and Freddie Fogarty uh, and some of the crew up there staged this demonstration in uh, November 1971 on the occasion of a visit by some obscure branch of the British aristocracy. Maybe it was Princess Margaret or somebody. Um, and they staged this sit-down protest in the main street of Darwin. Now, folks, in my little box out at uh, Victoria University where I work these days, I've got a little box that's marked ASIA, the Aboriginal Security and Intelligence Organisation. <laughs> and in that little box, I found an interesting artefact related to this demonstration. Because straight after this demonstration, a person from down this way sent a letter and a donation to the Larrakia people. And I'll just uh, read this here letter to you. I read about your protest during Princess Margaret's visit, and very moved by it. I think this sort of action is very important for Aboriginal people. And who's it signed by? Keith Winshutter. <laughs> <laughs> then it also, in 1971, the big event of that year was the Springbok Tour, uh, which brought out thousands of anti-apartheid demonstrators. And at one of the early demonstrations in the lead-up to the tour, Paul Coe jumped up on the stage and commandeered the microphone in his inimitable way, and essentially challenged, that's a nice way of putting it, challenged the uh, assembled anti-apartheid activists. And he said to him, well, how is it that you mob can turn out here in thousands protesting against racism from halfway around the world? And he put the challenge to them that unless you people join us in our land rights marches, we're going to have to consider you people as hypocrites because that's what you'll be. Now, to their eternal credit, the anti-apartheid movement sort of scratched their heads and instead of telling Carter going his stuff, they saw the logic in his argument and they began to turn up in large numbers at our, at our land rights demonstrations, all of which put more and more pressure on the McMahon government in Canberra. But in the meantime, that meant that we joined in the, uh, in the demonstrations. This is me outside the Squire Inn in, uh, during the Springbok tour. Here's Paul Coe and uh, Billy Craig, dressed in genuine Springbok. This won't mean anything to you. You'll have to go and read my history. Genuine South African rugby footy girls, he spoke which the Prime Minister of South Africa had said, no black man will ever wear a Springbok <laughs> So we appeared everywhere in it. <laughs> then, right at the end of 71, this. This happened. Now look at that headline fact. I'd be in Guantanamo Bay in an orange jumpsuit and chains if I said that today. You know? But I put it to you. This doesn't, this is not all it seems. <laughs> For example, look at the name of the Germans. Any of you mob old enough, the older ones among you will remember Simon Townsend for his uh, giggling persona on a certain children's television show called Simon Townsend's Wonderworld. Well, this is before he did that. And uh, I told the story in my stage show, I felt it obligatory to tell my version of the story anyway. And this is my version of the story, how this came about. Me and Billy Craig and Gary Williams are sitting in the Black Power Commune in Bondi one day, in the end of 71, we get a phone call. Hello, my name's Simon Townsend, I'm a journalist for the Sunday Australian. Uh, I'd like to come and have a story about Black Power. I said, yeah mate, no worries, come over. Huh? Come over, we'll tell you all about it. So Simon Townsend arrives at our door, and we say, no, we don't let white fellas into our commune, mate. You'll have to take us down the pub. <laughs> <laughs> so we set forth down to the local hotel. Uh, and we get Simon Townsend shouting us jugs of beer on Rupert Murdoch's expense account. <laughs> it's not quite the same league as those coppers in London, but nevertheless. <laughs> So we had a merry time. We told Simon Townsend all about, you know, the Aboriginal Legal Service, Black Power, blah, 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 blah. And then at some point in the afternoon, <laughs> Simon Townsend jumps up. He says, oh, uh, sorry, boys, I've got to go. I've got to get back to the office. 
got to write this story up. Billy Gray, quick thing, and Billy said, Ah, oh, hey, don't go yet, Simon, you know, shout us another round. He said, No, boys, I've got to go. I've really got to get back to work. <laughs> quick thing, and Billy Gray chucks a wink at us. And he says, Hey, Simon, don't go yet, mate. We haven't told you about the explosive. <laughs> <laughs> now, we've got an extra round of jokes. <laughs> now, folks, I told this story in Sydney at the Sydney Opera. Well, I told it down here when I did the show down here at the Arts Centre. And would you believe Simon Townsend's daughter came to my show? <laughs> and so, not long afterwards, I got, a, I got a email from Simon saying, I'm coming to your Sydney show, mate. I said, oh, well, okay, fair enough, no sweat. I think, no, gee, what's going to happen? Well, I've since been in touch with Simon Townsend after he came to the show in Sydney. And strangely enough, his version of this story is completely different, mate. <laughs> But I'm the historian! <laughs> but the end result of this particular article, uh, well, it intensified what had already been happening. And that is that uh, Asia seemed to, the real Asia, the Australian Superior Central Asia, uh, suddenly started taking a lot more notice of it. And here's some uh, genuine Asia surveillance photographs of me and Dennis Walker uh, behaving suspiciously. <laughs> vicinity of the Commons Party headquarters in Sydney in uh, 1972. Now for those of you, the older ones amongst you, the older folk amongst you, uh, you don't have to quite uh, uh, qualify for a seniors card, but if you've waited 30 years and you reckon you've got an ASIO file, after 30 years all ASIO files revert to the National Archive. So I've been collecting my ASIO file now for about 10 years and there's another big pile from the latest instalment uh, that I've got to go and uh, the camera soon and pick up. So if you reckon you've got an ASIO file, it's easy to, sh you know, prove it facts. You know? Because my experience is, most people of my generation say, oh, I'd have an ASIO file. I haven't got an ASIO file. <laughs> ASIO wasn't interesting. And it must be, it must be really hurtful. You know? <laughs> to think, of all that effort you put in as a political activist way back, and they didn't even notice you. you know? <laughs> Photos, there's, a, there's a lesson here for the young folk, for the kiddies. Now, undoubtedly, if you're a young person in this audience, you're aspiring to have an Asian vibe. <laughs> by being in this audience, you've probably got one now. <laughs> but the lesson for you young folk is you've got to think ahead. Because you've got to think, okay, Asia is going to be here this weekend, they're going to be taking my photo. So you've got to make sure You've got to think ahead, you've got to think to yourself, not only what's going to look cool today. <laughs>